now without wasting any time okay let me start one of the major topic in orthopedics so please uh, pay attention here uh, this is a bone tumor this is a big topic so we need few more classes to complete it now in the beginning okay uh, you have already done this in pathology in pathology what is the basic definition or meaning of neoplasm so see that this is the definition of neoplasm this is given by willis it is also known as willis definition a neoplasm is an abnormal mass of the tissue the growth of that tissue is uncoordinated with that of the normal tissue and that persist in the same excessive manner after the cessation of the stimulus which evoke the change so this is a complete definition of a tumor or a neoplasm so it is abnormal mass of tissue it continue to grow even after the stimulus is stopped okay once the process is started it will continue that is the meaning and it is not you know coordinated with that of the normal tissue it is out of control this is called neoplasm an important additional component here is there is the presence of genetic alteration which alter cell growth and that genetic alteration is known as a mutation okay it is known as mutation mutation is very common in case of neoplasm but let me uh, you know add few more things here till till today apart from few of the malignancy or tumor we do not know the exact etiology or pathogenesis so these are a bit of hypothetic you know thing here we we just you know blame uh, some um, causes yes that may be the reason for this malignancy that may be the reason for this malignancy something like that okay few of them we we know for example smoking is the cause for bronchogen carcinoma or lung carcinoma we we know that we have proven that but so many other uh, cancers or tumor we really do not know what is the cause so we blame environmental factors and the genetic alteration for many of the cancers so let's move on so all of you please uh, look at this x ray what can you see here yes what can you see high bodens area severe destruction of the bone very good i like uh, the terms which you are using severe destruction of the bone or hypodense area very good yes absolutely where where exactly can you can you name that bone where can you see that upper part of the tibia in the proximal head of the tibia okay yes and what is this joint what is this bone radius bone radius bone this bone is radius fine 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 radius very good so see this this is the first thing you need to learn in case of orthopedics and i am quite you know confident my student can handle that because they know the names of the bone by now so that these are the carpal bone here okay these are the carpal bone this is radius this is ulna so this see this see the distal end of the radius is having a big mass here okay this is a mass which is having osteolytic lesion there this is called osteolytic in the in the term of x ray or you can also call it hypodense area i agree with you and here is the mass see this right there okay this is lower end of the femur this is upper end of the tibia so right there there is a big mass present so these are the good example of bone tumors or tumor like condition so this class is all about not only the tumor but tumor like condition like cyst fibrous dysplasia and all things are combined together in this class Now another one see this okay see here there is a big mass here this mass looks like a lobulated mass a cystic type of mass with lot of septa okay lot of septa see this so giant cell tumor usually presents like this okay giant cell tumor usually present like this or it looks this way now what can you see here 
Yes. What is this? Pathological uh, fracture may occur. Fracture. Very good. Very good. Okay. Yes. In the bone. Exactly. I'm quite impressed with the term which you are using. This may be a case of pathological fracture. Always answer like that. Okay. Think that you, because uh, no history was provided to you, simple x ray was shown. So the examiner wants you to answer in this way. It may be a case of pathological fracture. And if they ask why, why not? This is a traumatic type of fracture. Then you can say, I can see some lesion in that area. Now see this, it looks like, it looks like a cavity there inside. See this, this one, okay? Look here, it has extended up to here. It is not a, you know, traumatic, plain traumatic type of fracture. So that's why pathological fracture is a very good term which you should use here. Excellent. The bone was already weak by some lesion there. On top of that, there is a fracture. So pathological fracture. Maybe it's a, it's a type of bone cyst or bone tumor. Another one, where's the problem in this X-ray? Can you find it out? In the knee joint. Is this knee joint? This is not knee joint. This is elbow joint, isn't it? Sorry, in the ulna. Okay, now see there. Good. So this, there is the problem. See this? Exactly. In the distal head of the ulna. See this? See this? This is the proximal part of the ulna. Excellent. This is the proximal part of the ulna. This is the radius. This is the head of the radius. You know, this is the X-ray of a of a child. So the epiphysis is still have not get fused. So it looks like this. This is also the epiphysis of distal end of the radius. So nothing is wrong here. So you need to, you know, uh, uh, see a lot of X-ray to make this concept. This is a epiphyseal plate of cartilage. So I cannot see it on the X-ray. This is epiphysis. Here. Now see this, but this is absolutely abnormal here. The upper end of the uh, ulna should never looks like this white with a, a bit of, you know, mass there. Okay, osteolytic area again. And uh, see this? A bit of, you know, irregularity I can clearly see. Another one. So no students are, are can be confused here. There is a big mass, okay? which is growing from the distal end of the femur. This is femur. There is tibia. This is a knee joint, okay? So when you see this type of thing, osteosarcoma comes in your mind as a differential diagnosis. Osteosarcoma, it may present like that. Now with this, you know, a background information on the x-ray. Now you already got, got something in your mind. Yes, how bone tumor behave or how they look in the x-ray. Okay, so let's enter into the topic now. Now tumors, tumor-like lesion and cyst are considered together in the classification of bone tumor because sometimes we get confused. Many of the clinical presentation and management are a bit similar between these conditions. That's why all of them are classified together. Benign lesions are quite common. Primary malignant ones a bit rare. That is a good thing for us and the patient. So benign lesions are easier to treat than malignant one. We all know that. Now let's straight away go to that classification. Most classification of bone tumor are based on the recognition of the dominant tissue in the various lesion. Now, what do you mean by that? Sometimes the tumor are osteoblastic in nature. Sometimes the tumor are osteoclastic in nature. Now, osteoblastic means bone forming tumor. Osteoclastic means bone destroying tumor. Okay. Sometimes they are primary tumors. Sometimes they are secondary tumors. Sometimes they, you know, originate from the bone forming cells. Sometimes they originate from cartilage, okay? Sometimes they originate from histiocyte or some of the macrophages, sometimes from the blood vessel. So accordingly, so many classifications are included there. Now, 
the classification which we are using here is uh, you know uh, described or modified by dr iskazovich okay in 1994 now let's talk about what is that classification all about see this a bit of uh, you know complicated one but when you you know go through it it is not that complicated as well see there now bone forming okay the bone forming uh, types of uh, tumors let's talk about them first these are the predominant tissue which are present in the tumor and they are benign and the malignant counterpart so bone forming tumors the benign one are osteoma osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma see there osteoma osteoblastoma osteoid osteoma whereas the malignant counterpart are osteosarcoma this is a very important topic which we are going to talk in detail okay in this class so osteosarcoma can be of different type according to the location now cartilage forming tumors benign are chondroma osteochondroma chondroblastoma and chondromyxoid fibroma okay so uh, this uh, you know may not be there uh, that's why the question mark is there so this is not a very regular member of the classification whereas the malignant counterpart is known as chondrosarcoma chondrosarcoma now let me ask you one simple question here what is sarcoma and what is carcinoma yes what is sarcoma and what is carcinoma anyone sarcoma is the malignant tumor of the bone and uh, good yes yes noma is originate from epithelial cells very good and and sarcoma in in sar sarcoma is originated from connective tissue sir excellent very good i want this this particular point here now there is no confusion if malignant tumor originates from the epithelial tissue we use the term carcinoma okay like adenocarcinoma squamous cell carcinoma isn't it transitional cell carcinoma these are the different terms and then if the malignancy originates from the connective tissue or mesenchymal tissue we use the term sarcoma like osteosarcoma chondrosarcoma liposarcoma rhabdomyosarcoma okay leiomyosarcoma all of these are uh, important terms okay some guys are disturbing a lot now see this so chondrosarcoma so you already got the meaning so chondrosarcoma is the malignant okay tumor which originates from the cartilage so they may be central peripheral juxta cortical clear cell or mesenchymal juxta cortical is next to the cortex juxta okay is very nearby to the cortex okay that's the meaning we don't need to know in that much detail just remember chondrosarcoma is the malignant counterpart of cartilage forming bone tumor now from the fibrous tissue fibroma and fibromatosis fibroma is a singular fibromatosis is a plural means multiple fibroma are present we call it fibromatosis whereas fibrosarcoma is the malignant one now mixed is a chondromyxoid fibroma cartilage and the myxomatous substance joint cell tumor is a special type of bone tumor we are going to talk in in this topic it may be benign osteoclastoma or malignant osteoclastoma now one important point here we all know what is osteoclast osteoclast is the bone eating cell okay actually it's a type of macrophage which is present in the bone the main function is resorption of the bone this giant cell tumor cell looks like osteoclast that's why the term osteoclastoma is given it can be benign or malignant now another classification is a marrow tumor bone marrow tumor these are ewing's sarcoma and multiple myeloma both of these are very important okay from the clinical point of view So we are going to discuss both of these. What is multiple myeloma? Yes. What is that? Uh, it's the malignancy of plasma cell. Excellent. Very good. 
malignancy of plasma cell. Very nice. So this is actually the commonest primary bone tumor. Commonest primary bone tumor is myeloma. And this is, of course, the malignant one. Now, from the vascular tissue, hemangioma, okay, hemangiopericytoma, and hemangioendothelioma. So different, you know, parts of the blood vessel, the different cells, peri pericytes are the supporting cells of the blood vessel. So they are also involved here. Angiosarcoma is the malignant counterpart. Other connective tissue like fibroma, fibrous histiocytoma and lipoma. These are the benign one and fibrosarcoma, malignant fibrous histiocytoma or liposarcoma are the malignant one. Now, what is this histiocyte? Anyone, what is histiocyte? I'm sure you have heard this term before. Histiocyte means what type of cells are they? Who can answer this? Necrophages in the tissue level. They are macrophages in the tissue. Very good. Exactly. These are called mononuclear cell, or they are type of macrophages. They are histiocyte. Okay. So if a tumor originates from them, we call it histiocytoma. It can be benign or it can be malignant. Now, other tumor like neurofibroma or neurilemoma. Now, neurilemoma means neurilemal sheath is one of the covering of the nerve fiber. So from there, if the tumor originates, we call it neurilemoma. And the malignant counterpart are adamantinoma and coldoma. Okay, these are the malignant one. These are not very common, but sometimes patients may present with this. Adamantinoma sometimes may occur even in the mandible, mandible in the facial region. So uh, let me make it simple for you. If from the exam point of view, you know, this is a common question, but you don't need to write all of these together. Just write one or two member from each of the one. Like bone forming, very easy. Cartilage forming, absolutely easy. You can always remember one or two example. And other, don't forget the giant shell tumor here, okay? And don't forget the marrow tubers. Others are the plus point for you. If you remember, you can write. Even if you forget, it doesn't matter that much. So bone forming tumor, you should always remember. Cartilage forming tumor, you should remember. Then giant shell tumor, special type of tumors. And then the marrow tumors. Let's move on. Now, this is a very good, you know, schematic diagram which is telling us the different types of bone tumor once again. See there, they may originate from the epiphysis, they may originate from metaphysis, or they may originate from the diaphysis. And these are the different names. Adamantinoma, osteoid osteoma, chondromyxoid fibroma, osteosarcoma, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, okay? Malignant fibrous histiocytoma. So I have, I've, you know, given the full form here so that you don't get confused. In chondroma, chondroblastoma, okay? So the different uh, terms are here. You can go through them on your own. So sometimes they are bone cyst. So bone cysts are also included in the same topic of bone tumor. Frankly speaking, they are not tumor. They are the cyst formation inside the bone, but they may manifest as the same, like a benign bone tumor. That's why it is written here. Where may be the location of this bone tumor? See this, in the transverse plane, okay. there may be a central, eccentric, cortical, or paraosteal. Now, central, okay, towards the central part of the bone. Now, in chondroma is the example. Eccentric means to a, on the side, eccentric. It may grow outwards. That's what the term eccentric. So giant cell tumor, GCT, giant cell tumor, osteosarcoma, and chondromyxoid fibroma. Cortical, okay, on the cortex of the bone, non-ossifying fibroma and osteoid osteoma. These are pure cortical one. Whereas parosteal means just on the side of the periosteum. Okay. This is parosteal osteosarcoma and osteochondroma. So just try to remember, even if you do not, you know 
remember these example, but these types are important. Where are they present? Sometimes examiner will show you the X-ray and ask you, which, where is the location? Can you exactly take the name of that location? Whether it is central, eccentric, cortical, or parostial. Now let's uh, look at this, uh, you know, schematic diagram. Then you can clearly understand what I'm talking here. This is called, see the central in chondroma, right at the center. Okay. Eccentric is this one. It is growing a little bit outwards, okay? Outwards or towards the end. A cortical, right at the cortex, right at the cortex. And parostial, okay, parostial means right next to the periosteum. Now, another type is also there, which is the, you know, classification of the bone tumor according to the longitudinal plane. And these are whether they develop in the epiphysis, whether they develop in the metaphysis, or whether they develop in diaphysis. The few of the examples are here. So in the epiphysis, okay, it's a cartilage mainly, you know, so related to the cartilage. And one important, uh, you know, type is a giant shell tumor. So cartilage forming tumor along with giant shell tumor. Now see this, chondroblastoma is associated with cartilage. Osteoclastoma is another term for giant shell tumor and clear cell chondrosarcoma. This is a malignant counterpart of the cartilage forming tumor and the special type of cells are called clear cell. This is a histological description. Metaphysis, osteosarcoma, very, very important one, develops from the metaphysis of the bone. Chondrosarcoma is a cartilage, you know, forming malignant tumor. In chondroma, again, associated with, you know, uh, cartilage. See this, chondro is the term, it is for cartilage. Simple bone cyst. This is called aneurysmal bone cyst. Aneurysmal bone cyst very, you know, expanded type of bone cyst, bigger than the simple one. This is called aneurysmal bone cyst. We are going to talk about that. Brody's abscess, okay, is another one. Chondromix white fibroma is the other one. Now, in the diaphysis, Ewing sarcoma, very important type of malignancy. It uh, mainly originates from the medullary cavity, okay, or you can say bone marrow. Multiple myeloma, also originating from bone marrow, from the plasma cell and followed by some others. So these two are the important one here. Now, according to the age, okay, which uh, neoplasm develops in which age? Now, look at the highlighted one only. These are the important one for us. Osteosarcoma is a malignant tumor of the younger generation from 10 to 25. So this is a very important point. So if that type of, you know, portion or that age comes to us and if they are complaining of bone pain, bone swelling, pathological fracture and all those things, we can think about osteosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma, 30 to 60 years, giant shell tumor, 20 to 40 years and Ewing sarcoma, again, younger people or younger patient, pediatric age group and adolescent five to 20, okay? And other are occurring in the different age group. After, you know, discussing the classification of bone tumors, let's enter into the another important part of this lecture that is clinical presentation. How bone tumors manifest? Now, let's start from the history. History means the symptom what manifestation you know they have and with what problem they come to the hospital. The history is often prolonged and this unfortunately results in a delay in obtaining the treatment. So many of the patient, you know, they don't uh, uh, take it seriously. They take it for granted and they don't seek the attention of the doctors. And by the time they come, the disease is already established or the disease has already metastasized outside the bone in case of malignant tumor. Patients may be completely asymptomatic until the abnormality is discovered on X-ray. 
Sometimes they, they don't have any symptom. They just come for something else. And when we do the X-ray, that disease can be diagnosed. Okay, let's move on. Now, now some other points regarding the you know her history. Let's talk about it. Okay. What is the relation of age according to the history? What age, uh, what, uh, you know, information uh, does age provides us in the diagnosis of bone tumors? Now, it may be a useful clue. Remember, just before the break, we have uh, talked about one, you know, important table. And certain tumors are common in that particular age. So that, uh, you know, explains everything. Many benign lesions present during childhood and adolescence, but so do some primary malignant tumor, notably Ewing's tumor or Ewing's sarcoma and osteosarcoma. They also occur in quite young individuals. Okay. But whereas the secondaries or secondary metastatic tumor in the bone, of course, occur in very older people, uh, later than sixth decade or after 60 years of age. Uh, for example, what I'm saying here, like a uh, carcinoma of the thyroid, okay, renal cell carcinoma, GI tract malignancies, if they involve the bone, prostate cancer, if they involve the bone, then usually the patient is much older than the usual one. Chondrosarcoma and fibrosarcoma typically occur in older people, fourth or sixth decade. Now, they are not a secondary malignancy, they are the primary one, but the age is older. And myeloma, which is the most common of all primary malignant bone tumor, is seldom seen before the sixth decade. So myeloma is also a tumor of the older age. In patients over 70 years of age, metastatic bone lesions are more common than all primary tumors together. And if your examiner asks, can you give examples of the metastatic bone lesion? We are going to talk, okay, towards the end of this big topic. Don't worry. But right now, when the term has come, you know, you need to take few names like uh, thyroid. Now, recently we talked about thyroid carcinoma. Which of the thyroid cancer commonly metastasized to the bone? Which one? Yes, anyone? Follicular, follicular carcinoma. Excellent, follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. Very good. I clearly told you during that time that this is a common question in the exam. So don't forget, okay, follicular. But not only that, breast cancer commonly metastasized to the bone. Lung cancer commonly goes, prostate cancer. So there are so many others. Now, pain is a very common complaint of a bone tumor, pain. Let's talk a little bit about that. That pain in the bone may be caused by the rapid expansion with the stretching of the surrounding tissue, which is quite common, especially in case of malignant tumor because it grows very rapidly. There may be central hemorrhage or necrosis or degeneration in the tumor, again, more common in the malignant tumor, or it may occur because of incipient pathological fracture, means fracture is almost okay there, or it has already occurred. So these are thus some important points. However, even a tiny lesion may be very painful if it is encapsulated in dense bone uh, or, you know, for example, that is osteoid osteoma. This is a type of, you know, benign tumor. We are going to talk about that. So very typical features are there. Very painful during the nighttime, okay? And uh, X-ray has a very typical feature. So though it is a benign one, it will be very painful in that particular part of the bone. Quite easy to diagnose, actually. If that is the presentation, then we take the X-ray. X-ray will be confirmatory. Another important uh, clinical feature would be swelling. Okay, no swelling. So what is there uh, in the swelling? The swelling may be quite alarming here. Often, though, patients seek advice when their when your mass becomes painful or continues to grow. A history of trauma is offered so frequently that it cannot be dismissed as having no significance. Now, let me clarify this. When we talk about the topic of fracture 
I clearly told you sometimes, you know, uh, patients are a bit of, uh, you know, misguided there. They suffer from slight or trivial trauma. And because of that trauma, you know, there will be a lot of pain in that local area and they blame everything for the trauma. But actually that's the coincidence. They already having some bone mass or bone tumor there. And that trauma has just, you know, caused the lesion uh, on top of that. So same thing here, swelling and the pain. It may be associated with a, a bit of trauma, but we should not be misguided by that. If you are in doubt, go for the investigation and that will clearly show whether there is a mass or not. But if swelling is there in the bone, you know, then we can clearly think about bone tumor. Let's move on. Another one in the history is the neurological symptom. Neurological symptoms can be paresthesia, or numbness, these are the sensory symptoms. Paresthesia means tingling and numbness sensation. Okay, It may be caused by pressure upon or stretching of a peripheral nerve. That is the, you know, function of a, or, you know, adverse, uh, you know, point regarding a tumor, isn't it? It's a mass. So that mass may give compression over the peripheral nerve and that can cause all the problem. Okay. One minute. Okay, now the progressive dysfunction is more ominous and suggests invasion by an aggressive tumor in case of neurological symptom. What does that mean? If there is a paralysis of certain muscle, if there is a weakness of certain muscle, then we believe that tumor is highly aggressive. It is probably a malignant one. It is causing local invasion and it is damaging the nerve. Pathological fracture, every student know by now, Maybe the first and you know a clinical signal for the tumor which is inside the bone. Now the term pathological fracture is used when the bone is already you know a little bit involved. Okay, the bone is already weakened by some other mechanism, and as a result of this, fracture can occur quite easily. Uh, even there is a slight amount of injury or trauma. Let's move on. Now, there are certain red flags during the history taking. Now, what are these red flags? Okay, red flag means they are the dangerous, you know, symptom. They are a bit of cautious one. So the orthopedic surgeon needs to take them seriously. Persistent skeletal pain, even, okay, after the treatment. That is a red flag. Who knows? The malignant tumor is developing inside the bone. Localized tenderness, take it as a seriously. That may be a case of infection. We are not sure, but if we take it seriously, then only we go for the investigation. Spontaneous fracture or pathological fracture, always take it seriously. And enlarging mass or soft tissue swelling as well. Who knows, the bone or tumor may have invaded the soft tissue surrounding and the swelling in the soft tissues because of that. So these are the red flag. If they occurs a bit longer, than the expected, then definitely something is seriously wrong. Now, during the examination, what we do? See here. Is there a lump or not? Okay. Is there a lump or not? That is the first thing. Okay. We like to ask. And if there is a lump, where does it arise? Where exactly? Which part? Is it in the epiphysis? Is it in the metaphysis or is it in the diaphysis? And which bone? So that has to be done. Is it discrete or ill-defined? Now, what is discrete? Discrete mass means what? So the Anyone? mass which invade the local tissues. Is that discrete? Are you sure? Now, this any any Sir, which are localized to only one area. Mass. Okay. Now, you know, it's a very it's simple. A kind of dispersal. Okay. Okay. Sure. I'm listening. Yes. Anybody else? Discrete. What do you mean by discrete? Discrete okay. means small. 
the small page is like. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, now listen here. This is very, you know, common medical term which is used in a case of mass or any lesion, you know. Discrete means I can feel that mass from everywhere, means the mass is not attached to the surrounding area. The circumference or the border of that mass is well felt. This is called discrete mass. Whereas ill-defined means it is not properly felt. Probably the mass has already invaded the local area. Now, with this description, you can clearly tell me discrete mass is a feature of benign tumor or malignant tumor. Yes, discrete. Is it benign or malignant? Benign. 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 Exactly. benign. exactly. Discrete is a feature of benign tumor, whereas ill-defined margin is a feature of malignant tumor. Okay, that's what they're trying to explain here. Is it soft or hard or pulsatile? So we need to examine this during our physical examination. Now, if the soft tissue, okay, is the cause of the swelling, then it may be soft. If there is extensive necrosis, okay, uh, then it may be soft. Otherwise, most of the bony tumors are hard. And pulsatile means it's an aneurysm. Whenever the term pulsatile comes, they're talking about aneurysm, remember that. But there is one exception. Sometimes a mass which is present right on the surface of the artery is also pulsatile, but I can separate that easily. When I put two of my finger above the, or on the surface of aneurysm, I'm saying, okay, or on the skin, which is right above the aneurysm, the fingers separate. When the mass pulsate, the fingers separate from each other this is definitely a case of aneurysm. Whereas if the pulse is transmitted from the artery to that mass, the finger will not separate. The finger just felt that pulse. So this is an important clinical point for you regarding pulsatile mass. Another one, is it tender or not? We always do this examination. Tenderness is a feature of inflammatory or infective swelling. Usually malignant, you know, tumor or benign tumor are not tender, but there are lots of exceptions, okay? I'm talking about a general thing here, general thing. Sometimes if the, if the tumor has, you know, uh, invaded the surrounding tissue, then it may be tender because of that thing. Sometimes if the tumor is rapidly enlarging, especially the malignant tumor again, rapidly enlarging, there is a hemorrhage inside, then because of the distension, because of the stretching, it may be tender. So there are lots of points associated with it. Swelling is sometimes diffuse and the overlying skin is warm and inflamed and it can be difficult to distinguish a tumor from infection or a hematoma. That's why we need to take the help of investigation. The infective lesion also have the same clinical feature, all the features of inflammation. It is hot, it is red, isn't it? Uh, it may be you know, some other features like pain or tenderness. So some of the malignancy can also present like that. So we have, uh, we have to take the help of investigation. And investigation will clearly tell us what are the things here. Now, if the tumor is near a joint, there may be an effusion, there may be an effusion or a limitation of the movement. Effusion means collection of free fluid inside the joint. So that thing may be there. Spinal lesion, whether benign or malignant, often cause muscle spasm and back stiffness or a painful scoliosis. But not always, you know, not always the tumors which does that. We recently talked about one topic, which is known as tuberculosis of the spine. That one also will have similar type of features. So we need to be careful. The examination will focus on the symptomatic part, but don't forget to, you know, include the area of lymphatic drainage and often the pelvis, abdomen, chest, and spine. Who knows? The metastasis has already occurred to those lymph nodes. Who knows? There may be distant metastasis. So don't forget to examine. So in one sentence, examine the patient as a whole. Okay, start from the more important one and go to the other place. That is the way.
let's move on now another important part of our you know examination and investigation or approach you can say is the x-ray x-ray is absolutely necessary especially in this type of condition so what are the questions to ask when studying an x-ray and these questions you need to ask to yourself okay because you are the one who is reading the x-ray if your senior is teaching you how to read the x-ray the senior may ask you that question also is the lesion solitary or are there multiple lesion that's the first one solitary means single okay and sometimes there are more than one so there are multiple lesions what type of bone is involved which bone is this okay is it a long bone flat bone irregular bone short bone that's the first question and second which exactly in the bone where is it in the epiphysis is it in the metaphysis is it in the diaphysis like that so see this where is the lesion in the bone are the margin of the lesion well or ill defined another important question we can differentiate benign from the malignant benign tumors are well defined malignant tumors are ill defined are there flex of calcification in the lesion or not now calcification occurs okay uh, as a result of some dead and devitalized tissue inside the tumor or inside any inflamed area that is known as dystrophic calcification which is quite common in different parts of the body sometimes metastatic calcification can also occur that is altogether a very different thing is the cortex eroded or destroyed we are talking about bone tumor remember so this is a very very important point here is there osteolytic area or not osteolytic area means bone is destroyed or eroded is there any periosteal new bone formation that is known as osteoblastic lesion now the bone is formed there okay so this is important point we need to note it and does the tumor extend into the soft tissue or not especially malignant tumor has this type of property they break down the periosteum and they skip outside to the soft tissue and they involve there a good example is osteosarcoma now have a look here this is a excellent slide which is telling us what is the radiographic difference between a benign and malignant bone tumor so these are the benign one these are the malignant one so let's talk about it so benign tumors are well defined and they have sclerotic border what is sclerosis sclerosis means what anyone fibrosis it looks uh, dense area in the x-ray very good i i accept both of your answer sclerotic is a densely fibrotic but in the in this condition we are talking about the bone you know so sclerotic means the dense area it looks slightly more white than the nearby area this is called sclerotic area in the bone outside in any other soft tissue if we use the term sclerosis this means fibrotic now there is lack of soft tissue mass because benign tumor they usually do not go outside the bone even if they go you know what they do they will elevate the periosteum they do not destroy the periosteum and go outside there is periosteal reaction okay because of the elevation when periosteum is elevated there is always the reaction there and there is a geographic bone destruction means in a particular area you know it 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 happens like this it's not a haphazard one uh, we can clearly find the margin or the border of that destroyed area whereas in the malignant one there is a interrupted periosteal reaction it is incomplete or irregular there is a moth eaten or permeative bone destruction okay moth eaten means here and there not a uniform type there is a soft tissue mass because of the destruction of the periosteum it has extended outside into the soft tissue and there is wide zone of transition wide zone of transition means transition is the area uh, or the you know a site uh, 
between the abnormal tissue and the normal tissue. So it is a white zone there. Now, even, you know, better terms than which we just discussed are here in this slide. That means if we take the X-ray, okay, only the X-ray features here, how to distinguish benign from the malignant bone lesion. Now, see this, this is a very, very good slide. In benign, uh, usually there is no periosteal reaction. There are some, uh, you know, exceptions there, but let's talk about the general, uh, you know, uh, concept. In benign, there is no periosteal reaction. Whereas in malignant tumor, like osteosarcoma is the perfect example. There is acute periosteal reaction, which may form cord man's triangle, onion skin like appearance, or sunburst appearance. All of these, you know, we are going to talk later on. These are the special radiological finding in case of osteosarcoma. Among them, okay, the sunburst appearance and cord man's triangle are very severe feature. There is a thick industrial reaction. There is well-developed bone formation, and there is intraosseous and even calcification in the benign tumor. Whereas in the malignant, okay, there is broad border between the lesion and the normal bone. There is varied bone formation, and there is extraosseous and irregular calcification. Now let me make it easier for you. Okay, probably you are a little bit confused here. In case of malignant tumor, these points are absolutely important in the periosteum. Don't forget them. And apart from that there is irregular type of calcification in case of malignant tumor because they, they, there is bleeding. There is a necrosis going on inside the uh, tumor, you know, in case of malignancy. Now, somebody may ask this question, why? Why is there high chance of hemorrhage and necrosis in malignant tumor than the benign? Answer is very easy. It all depends on the rapidity of the growth. Just think of a situation here. If a tumor is rapidly growing, that tumor, okay, need a lot of blood supply for the nutrition, but that synthesis of the new blood vessels or the supply of blood may not be enough for the rapidity of the growth. So because of this relative ischemia, there would be necrosis. So necrosis is very common in case of malignant tumor. And these new blood vessels which are synthesized, they can rupture and hemorrhage is also quite common. So these are a bit rare or usually not seen in case of benign tumor. Now let's move on. Apart from the X-ray, what are the other investigation we like to do? Radionuclide scanning, okay? Radionuclide scanning or radioisotope scanning. This is especially useful in the case of metastasis. So if you believe the metastasis has already occurred, then this is a special type of investigation. CT scan is always done in case of bone tumor, always. CT clearly tells us how big is the tumor, okay? What is the margin or the border of the tumor? Is the local invasion already occurring or not? What about the structures which are nearby? Are they compromised or not? All this information is provided by CT scan. And CT can also be done to find out the metastasis. For example, if you believe long metastasis has already occurred, take the CT scan of the chest, abdomen, okay? Take the CT of the abdomen to find out liver metastasis or the lymph node metastasis in the abdomen, like that. MRI is another one. So MRI provides further information its greatest value is in the assessment of tumor spread, either within the bone, into a nearby joint, or into the soft tissue. So MRI also can be done. And biopsy, okay, no need to discuss about the importance of the biopsy. It will give you the diagnosis. It can be done as a needle biopsy or open biopsy. Open biopsy means like a surgery. Let's move on. See there. So we are talking about the general aspect first, okay? Then only we enter into the topic proper. So this is the general aspect. So if you if you understand this is a general discussion, the rest of the topic will be very easy for you. So what are the principles of management of bone tumor? 
So if the tumor is benign and asymptomatic, okay, if the tumor is benign and asymptomatic, it depends how the patient is taking it. If the patient is not too concerned about the treatment, you just leave it like that. You just leave it like that with a good counseling. If the patient is worried about it, if you yourself are worried, sometimes there is a slight amount of doubt, you know, then go for the biopsy, confirm it. And if you still doubt exists, go for the surgical management. Benign symptomatic and enlarging tumors. Now there is a definite symptom and the tumors are getting bigger and bigger. Biopsy is always recommended and treatment is done by surgical excision. Okay, remove by marginal excision. So remove the tumor as well as some certain margin around it. Suspected malignant tumor. Okay, you already know what should we do now. Malignant tumors are the very dangerous one. So even if a slight you know, mass is left behind, you know, it can grow back, it can metastasize and all those problems. So further investigation should be carried like imaging and staging. Which stage is, is it exactly? Is it early stage or late stage? And whether there are metastasis occurring or not, find that out by proper imaging technique, like ultrasound, CT scan, like that. And treatment options should be discussed with the patient, including pros and cons. So different treatment options are available for us in the malignant tumor. Surgery is one of them. And surgery can be of different types here. Remember, amputation is a type of surgery in case of malignant tumor of the bone. And that is a quite a devastating type of, type of treatment, isn't it? Patient will, limb, uh, will lose that part now after amputation. So as far as possible, we don't go for that you know, radical type of treatment. Some others are radiotherapy, chemotherapy, okay? A bit of marginal excision, radical excision, different terms are there. See this? So these are the methods of treatment, especially in case of malignant tumor. Benign tumor we already talked about. Benign are mainly treated by surgery and they usually do not recur after the surgery. This is the general concept. So one is tumor excision, another is a salvage of the limb or limb saving surgery, limb salvage, okay? Amputation, this is a you know very, uh, what should I say? The, we don't want to go for this as far as possible. We cut the limb, we cut that affected part. Okay, so this is amputation. Multi-agent chemotherapy, this is a chemotherapy and radiotherapy, you all know that. So uh, the top three are the type of surgery and this is chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Now, a little bit about tumor excision. So let's talk about the surgical principle here. Though we are talking about bone tumor, remember that these surgical principles are very useful in any field of tumor or malignancy. So please pay attention here. Surgical margin is described by one of four terms, intralesional, marginal, wide, or radical. These are the different terms. Intralesional, marginal, wide, or radical. So let's talk about them one after the other. What is intralesional resection? That means the plane of surgical dissection is within the tumor. Okay. The plane of surgical dissection is within the tumor. Intralesional resection. Now, this is often described as debulking because it always lives behind the gross residual tumor. You are not completely removing it at all. You are just taking a part of the tumor and uh, you know, uh, leaving a bit of part behind. Now, why? Why we go for this? Any idea? What is the reason for this debulking surgery? Who can answer this? Symptomatic relief. Very good. Excellent. This is a type of palliative therapy. Remember the term palliation. When you cannot provide the curative therapy, but patient is having a lot of 
symptoms, a lot of problems because of the tumor, you know. So if I reduce the size of the tumor, I am doing good for the patient. So this is known as debulking surgery. Now another type is a marginal resection. So that means it is achieved when the closest plane of the dissection passes through the pseudo capsule and pseudo capsule means the surrounding reactive tissue around the tumor. If I'm talking about benign tumor, it has got a nice capsule, okay? Now, if that benign tumor is growing a little bit faster than expected, then it can compress the surrounding soft tissue and it almost looks like a pseudo capsule there, okay? Even in malignant tumor, it may happen. So we, we go for the marginal resection, means a bit of area surrounding the tumor is also resected. This is the meaning. So it is done for most benign tumor and some low grade malignant tumor as well. Let's move on. Now look at this uh, you know, slide and you will further understand what we're talking here. So these are the different types of tumor excision. So radical, look at this dotted line here. This is radical one. The tumor is here. Tumor is here, but the radical resection tells us that the whole, you know, bone should be sacrificed. This is a massive type of surgery. This is known as wide local excision. Look at this dotted line here, this one, okay? So quite a big part of the normal uh, tissue is sacrificed, wide local excision. This is a marginal excision. That's what I was talking right now. Uh, just like a pseudo capsule may be formed there. So you remove a little bit part away from the main tumor and intracapsular excision. If you always, you know, uh, uh, means if there is a benign tumor, if you're talking about the benign tumor, then, you know, you, you remove that benign tumor completely and debulking surgery is you leave some of the tissues behind. It is only done in palliative type treatment. For example, removing the tumor may harm the patient uh, more than keeping behind the tumor. Okay, so that is a big decision for the surgeon. Don't be over enthusiastic sometimes. If the patient is very old, okay, uh, then removing the tumor completely may be more damaging for the patient than keeping uh, the tumor behind. So these are the different concept. So this one, okay, you can, uh, you know, read on your own there, okay? Now, this uh, slide is talking about the difference between wide resection and the radical resection. The radical, the large area is sacrificed. Large part is sacrificed. That's the meaning of the term radical. You see this? All the compartments that contain tumor are removed in block, remove at once. It involves removing the entire bone and the compartment of any involved muscle. And this is rarely used nowadays because this is a massive type of surgery. Whereas wide resection is achieved when the plane of dissection is in normal tissue. And a bigger part of the normal tissue is sacrificed here also. But it is you know, less destructive than the radical resection. And it is done for high-grade malignancy. Now, till now, what we have discussed, this is important. We have talked about what is malignant tumor, okay? We had that concept. Every student know that already. We have classified the bone tumor. That is an important question from the exam point of view. Then we talked about what are the common symptom and sign of the bone tumor. That's a general type of topic, okay? How to physically examine a case of bone tumor, what investigation we do, what are the important X-ray finding between the benign and malignant tumor. We also talked about that. And what is the overall management of a bone tumor, okay? Whether it is benign or malignant. So with this general discussion, let's enter into the different types of benign tumor now. Now see here, so these are the common types of benign tumor. Osteoma, which is also known as ivory osteoma. 
but more commonly used term is osteoma. Osteoid osteoma is another one. Chondroma, okay, fibroma and fibrous dysplasia and bone cyst. Now, though these are not a very true type of tumor, but still we like to you know talk them under the benign tumor because uh, you know they almost look a bit similar on the X-ray and the clinical manifestation are also similar. Let's just start with osteoma or ivory osteoma. Let's see here. This is growth from the surface of the bone. So let me underline this important point for you. Growth from the surface of the bone. It is common on the surface of the vault of the skull. Means they are arising from the cranial bones. This osteoma is a benign tumor from the bone. The name itself suggests oma is there at the end. So benign tumor originating from the surface of the bone. Okay. So this is the most common benign neoplasm of the nose and paranasal sinuses as well. So it may form a mass there. During examination, this is a smooth, non-tender tumor, which rarely causes symptom. If some symptoms are there, then it is because of the compression. If symptomatic, it can be easily cured by excision. This is a purely a benign tumor. So after surgical excision, you know, patient will be all right. And there is, a, uh, you know, very, very decreased chance of recurrence or no chance of recurrence. When the bone tumor grows on other bone, it is known as homoplastic osteoma. And when it grows on other tissue, it is called as heteroplastic osteoma. So this is a small point here, which is not, not very important. Now, just, uh, you know, have a look here. So this is the, you know, CT scan. So see this, this is orbit. Here is the orbit. And look at this, there is a growth. Okay, this is a growth. So this is the osteoma they are showing here. So this is the nasal cavity. These are the different, you know, turbinate. Turbinate. These are the nasal cavity. Here is the nasal septum. Okay, and uh, what is this? Anybody? What is this? This is structure. Any idea? Which structure I am showing here? This one. Maxillary sinus. Sir. Excellent. Very good. This is maxillary antrum or maxillary sinus. Uh, maxillary sinus. Okay. So, but we are concerned about this main main mass here. So this is osteoma. These are the different, you know, uh, uh, investigation again. Okay, CT, CT findings. There's osteoma here. There's the growth. Here is another growth. Okay, this is called bone window. The bone window, a part of a CT scan itself. And there is a mass also. Now, another type, which is even more important than osteoma, is called osteoid osteoma. From the exam point of view, they love to ask this. What is this osteoid osteoma? In this, uh, you know, case, there is osteoblastic mass, which is called a nidus, and this nidus is surrounded by a zone of reactive sclerosis. So nidus is at the center, and this is surrounded by a zone of reactive sclerosis inside the bone. This is called osteoid osteoma. And in the X-ray, we can see it very clearly. It is commonly seen in the second decade, okay? But sometimes from the second to fourth decade. The second decade is from 10, you know, 10 to 20 years. So decade means 10 years period. Male are more commonly affected than female. And the common site of osteoid osteoma are proximal femur, which is the most common, tibia bone and spine the posterior elements of the spine, okay? The lamina and the spinous process, they are also affected. It is usually not seen in the bones of membranous origin. Now, endochondral ossification and membranous ossification are two types of ossification that we studied in the basic, you know, uh, basic science. Endochondral ossification and membranous ossification. 
like a good example of membrane ossification is clavicle. Okay, so in those type of bone, osteoid osteoma is not seen. Regarding the clinical feature, there is dull pain, and this pain is worse at night. This is a very important symptom you need to ask to the patient. And when patient complain like that, you know, you suspect, yes, this might be a case of osteoid osteoma, and you take the X-ray, and then the disease can be diagnosed. So don't forget this, or at night. It is relieved with NSAID and not related to position or function and often aggravated by alcohol. We don't know what is the mechanism behind it, but if a person consumes alcohol, then the pain may be aggravated. Now, pain is elicited by local procedure, okay? It is elicited by local procedure. Means if you do some, some injection or something there, okay, some, some procedure, other surgical procedure, then pain is further more elicited. Now, this osteoid osteoma, okay, this is, you know, you cannot write like that in the exam, but now you can clearly understand because we are talking about this topic, but in the exam, it may be a general uh, thing, isn't it? So don't write like that. Osteoid osteoma is suspected in the spine. When a patient who is less than 30 years complains of constant type of back pain. Now, back pain is a very common problem in the general population, especially low back pain. Okay, low back pain. So see there, one of the cause is osteoma, though it is quite rare causes than other. The spine is a stiff, scoliotic, and a straight leg raising test is positive with no signs of nerve root compression. So you go for a straight leg raising test, okay? And there are no signs of nerve root compression here. Nerve root compression means you are comparing it with a, you know, intervertebral disc prolapse. So in that condition, you know, there's severe pain when I do a straight leg raising test. Regarding the radiological finding, okay? It will give you the diagnosis now. See there, it will show dense sclerosis, dense sclerosis surrounding the central small nidus. And this nidus is a radiolucent zone. So let me explain again. At the center, there is a radiolucent area, very small, around less than two centimeter, which is surrounded by a dense sclerotic margin. And I can clearly see that like a target lesion or like a bullseye lesion in the inner part of the bone where patient complains pain. And without any doubt, and this is a case of osteoid osteoma. Some of the differential diagnosis are osteoblastoma and other types of bone tumor. Non-suppurative osteomyelitis of Gare. We, we recently talked about this. It is known as Gare's sclerosing osteomyelitis and there is no post formation there. Sometimes even Brody's abscess may be considered and sometimes stress fracture may also be considered. But uh, some of the clinical feature may match, you know, that's why they are in included here. Otherwise, uh, this X-ray is very particular. Diagnosis, one is X-ray, okay, or the CT, another is Technetium 99M bone scan is a radioisotope scan. If we do that, there is an increased uptake in the nidus and decreased uptake in the reactive sclerotic zone because nidus is the active part. So it will actively uptake the radioisotope material. Whereas this reactive sclerotic zone will not take. So there is a clear cut, you know, distinguish between them and we can clearly identify it. It looks like headlight in fog or double density sign because of density difference, you know, they are comparing like that, okay? Headlight in fog or double density sign. In CT, it looks like a bullseye appearance. Let's move on. Let's see uh, how it looks now. All of you, please focus here now. Where is the lesion here? Okay, where is the lesion? You can clearly see here. On this, if you see 
here is the lesion. Okay, so let me use the spotlight. See this, this area. All of you, you can clearly see there is a nidus here at the center, and this nidus is surrounded by a sclerotic bone. See this, this, this area is a bit of sclerotic. This bone uh, part is thicker than this. So some sclerotic bones are here. And this is a nidus, see this? The clear cut nidus surrounded by a sclerotic bone. Very important finding. See this, it's a city, okay? See this, look at this area, nidus surrounded by sclerotic bone. This is sclerotic bone. Another one, look here, this area, okay? A nidus at the center, surrounded by sclerotic bone. Now, regarding the pathology and the treatment of osteoid osteoma, let's talk about it. This nidus, if we take this nidus out and analyze it, what are the things here? What type of cells are there? Then we have found that it is made up of osteoblast cells and non-myelinated axons. The axons, okay, they are the part of the nerves or the neurons, and they are non-myelinated here. The stroma is comprises of osteoblast, osteoclast, fibroblast, and blood-filled capillaries. Now I'm sure every student know what are osteoblasts and osteoclasts, right? What are they? What are they? Yes? Osteoclast is a um, type of microbial forming cell. Bone forming cell and bone absorption. Very Fibroblast good. Fibroblasts is a forming cell. Very good. Excellent. So I just, you know, uh, wanted to ask this question whether you are actively listening or not, okay? I'm 100% sure every student know the meaning of this. Osteoblast are bone forming cell and the mature of them are called osteocyte. Osteoclast are a type of macrophages which acts as a bone resolving cell and fibroblast, everybody know fibroblast, okay? They lead to the formation of fibrous tissue and capillaries are also there. They transform into osteoblastoma but there is no malignant transformation. So later on, they may, okay? Uh, transform into osteoblast tumor, another types of benign tumor. But luckily, there is no malignant transformation. Regarding the treatment, this is a self-limiting lesion. So if the patient is not too much concerned about it, you know, we can go for the conservative treatment with NSAID because they just cause pain, nothing else, just the pain. So if patient is afraid of surgery, some people are like that they don't want to go for surgery at all, then we can continue the conservative treatment. But if we can counsel the patient, and if we say this is a type of tumor in her bone, this is a benign tumor, and if we remove it, you will be very free from your symptom, then people may be ready and we go for surgery. So to eradicate the pain producing nidus, okay, we need to go for surgery. Complete removal of that mass is necessary. And the latest, another type of is percutaneous radiofrequency ablation. You kill that nidus with the help of radiofrequency material. Now, okay, so I'll continue, okay, till uh, the another uh, class is over, then I'll stop, okay? So please uh, pay attention. That will be nice for all of us. So another type of uh, benign tumor or tumor-like condition is known as fibroma and fibrous dysplasia. Now, this is a spectrum of condition with failure or partial failure of ossification, which is replaced by fibrous tissue. So just think about it. We think our bones are very strong, but in some of the areas, you know, the ossification fails, the process of bone formation fell, and it is replaced by the fibrosis or fibrous tissue. Now, definitely that area will be very weak now because there is no proper bone there and easily fracture can occur there or bony deformity can occur there. This type of condition is known as fibrous dysplasia and fibroma is definitely a type of benign tumor. So these are usually asymptomatic and often regress at puberty or after a fracture. Now, see there? 
So let's enter into the description. This is a non-ossifying fibroma. So it is also called fibrous cortical defect or metaphyseal cortical defect or fibrous janthoma. These are the different synonymous terms. So these are non-ossifying fibroma. There is no formation of the bone there. This is the most common musculoskeletal benign tumor we have. Occurs in 30% of the children. It is common in first two decades, means up to 20 years of age. And the common site of this fibroma are femur, tibia, and humerus. Okay. These all are long bones. 8% of the time, the multiple lesions are there, means multiple bones are affected. It is asymptomatic condition usually. And when we take the X-ray, it is a well-defined tumor because it's a benign tumor. It is an eccentric type of tumor, relatively located on the outer aspect of the bone and grow outside. And there's a radiolucent lesion in the metaphysis. There may be multilocular appearance, multiple septa are there, or they may be surrounded by a rim of sclerotic bone that does not expand the cortex and there is no periosteal reaction. Very typical features of benign tumor. Everything what we have discussed before, all the features are here in the X-ray. And treatment is observation. If the patient is too much concerned, go for the surgery. Okay. See this? Okay. Look at this tumor here. Right here. So this is a tibia. So upper part of the tibia. So this one. So see this? There is a, you know, uh, hyperdense area, osteolytic area. So I cannot see the uh, bony tissue there at the center. So there is a sclerotic area here, okay? So this is a typical example. Now, another interesting pathology which may occur uh, inside the bone is known as fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia, let's talk about it. This fibrous dysplasia is a developmental disorder in which the areas of trabecular bone are replaced by cellular fibrous tissue containing the flex of osteoid and the uban bone. The meaning itself is important here. What is trabecular bone first? What is this? And what is uban bone? Anyone? Sir, the fuban bone are the immature bone, sir. Very good. And trabecular bone are mature <clears throat> one, isn't it? Mature the, one, sir. Exactly. The proper lamellar. Lamellar. Exactly. The proper lamellar or mature type of bone, the trabecular bone, and uban bone are the immature one. Absolutely correct. So, so you already got the meaning here. That area is relatively weaker, okay, because uh, some you know osteoid tissue is there and uban bone is there in the place of trabecular bone. It may affect one bone, which is known as monoostotic, or one limb, which is called monomelic, or many bone, which is called polyostotic. Monoostotic is one bone, polyostotic is multiple, or monomelic is one. Polymelic is multiple limbs. If the lesions are large, the bone is considerably weakened and pathological fracture or progressive deformity may occur. Now, uh, I've included a bit of a picture here and you may see some of the picture doesn't look good at all because they may involve the different parts of the body. Pathological fracture and deformity are quite common. The most common site of the occurrence fib fibrous dysplasia are the proximal part of the femur, tibia, humerus, ribs, and craniofacial bone. So both longer as well as flat bone are affected here. Small single lesions are asymptomatic and large monoostotic lesion may cause pain or may be discovered only when the patient develops a pathological fracture. Okay, so similar like any other types of benign tumor uh, or tumor-like condition, they may also present similarly.
Now, what about the polyosteotic disease? Means multiple bones are affected. So this present in childhood or adolescent with pain, with limp, with enlargement of the bone, deformity or pathological fracture. Just think about a situation here. Both femurs are affected. Now there will be a problem. If tibia and femur both are affected or humerus are affected, polyosteotic means that, then definitely there will be more chances of sign and symptoms. And these are pain, limping, enlargement of the bone in the affected part, formation of deformity, or bending of the bone, you know, or pathological fracture. Isn't it? So these are the important point. Now, in untreated case, the characteristic deformities persist through the adult life. They already formed, they are soft bones, so deformities persist. Occasionally, the bone disorder is associated with cafe outlet spot or patches on the skin. Now, what is this cafe outlet spot associated with? Which condition? Neurofibromatosis. Neurofibromatosis. Excellent. Okay, very good answer. These are usually associated with neurofibromatosis. And that's why this fibrous dysplasia may be one of the association with neurofibromatosis. So when you study the topic of neurofibromatosis, especially type one, which is known as von Recklinghausen disease, one of the component of that is fibrous dysplasia. It is clearly mentioned there. That is a connection, you know, between this cafe outlet spot and fibrous dysplasia. Now, there is one uh, important term, which is known as Albright sign. This is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia and cafe outlet spot together with multiple endocrinopathy. Endocrinopathy, the endocrine glands are also having pathological problem. And that child, okay, uh, has a precocious sexual development. Means before the expected age, the sexual maturity occurs in the child. This is known as, you know, Albright sign. Sometimes it is a part of McCune Albright syndrome also. McCune Albright syndrome, or uh, let let this let me me make it very easy for you. Albright sign is enough. So what is that? Polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, cafe spot, and precocious sexual development. Another is Meza Broad sign. Okay, Meza Broad sign. This is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia with intramuscular myxoma. This is another type of tumor which may occur inside the muscle. This is not very importantly asked in the exam, but try to remember the Albright sign here. Look at this picture here. Okay. So what abnormality you have noted in this one? What is wrong here? Yes. Anybody? Look at it, this, this one. See this, there is a gross deformity, okay? There's gross deformity. Look at the, you know, uh, this breeze of the nose, it is deviated to the opposite side, okay? So I presume this orbit is normal. This is just the shifting of this, you know, a little bit uh, abnormality is occurring here, but this is grossly abnormal. This is shallow orbit, okay? And a gross deformity here. This is, one of the manifestation of fibrous dysplasia. And this lady is also having some problem here, especially in this. So this is a craniofacial fibrous dysplasia because these bones are involved. Now see this, this is, you know, uh, not good at all. Now one of the uh, differential diagnosis uh, has to be thought here. One type of tumor, if you have followed any, you know, major surgical textbook, one tumor is very commonly occurring in this site. Anybody can take the name of that tumor? Which tumor may present a bit like this in the head and neck area, especially in the mandible site? Burkitt lymphoma. Burkitt lymphoma sometimes may present like this type of mass, you know, but this is a fibrous dysplasia in this case. What is the radiographic appearance of fibrous dysplasia here? 
It mainly affects the metaphysis or diaphysial area, and there is a well-defined geographical lytic lesion because the bone is absent there. Okay, it may have ground glass hazy matrix because some some osteoid component or some some very immature type of bone may be present. That's why it may looks a bit of hazy. There is cortical thinning. The secondary deformities are quite common in weight bearing bone. Okay. One of them is called Sheffer's crook deformity. Sheffer's crook deformity. And because of this, there is a formation of micro fracture as, as well. There is a poorly defined areas of osteolysis. There may be cortical destruction and soft tissue involvement. And if these are present, you know, we, we think of a malignant transformation from this important pathology. See this? Poorly defined areas, cortical destruction and soft tissue involvement means uh, it is clearly going out of the site. And these are the features of malignancy. Now, these are very, uh, you know, good X-ray, okay? And quite commonly asked uh, in these days exam. You see this, this is monoostrotic fibrous dysplasia. Look here, where is the bone here? I cannot see the proper bone, but some flecky, flecky appearance is there, right? So this is a clear cut case of fibrous dysplasia. The upper femur with so-called Sheffer's croup deformity. This is the one. See the another bone which is affected. If more than one bones are affected, we call it polyostrotic. If only one bone is affected, we call it monoostrotic. This is another X-ray, see this, okay? A big area which is a defective and look at here this area. Now this area will become very weak and it can easily get fractured uh, in case of slight trauma. Another x-ray, see here, this area. Now sometimes you may get confused with another type of uh, you know, tumor also, so better to take a biopsy, okay, if you are confused. That investigation is always there. What is the treatment? Monoostrotic lesion, if they are asymptomatic, no treatment in asymptomatic condition. Now, indications of uh, treatment would be severe deformity, persistent pain, and pathological fracture. So we definitely need to go for the management now. And remember, they are uh, you know relatively younger type people. So the different types of treatment would be curatas and bone grafting, curators and bone grafting. The cortical yellow graft is preferred. The cortical yellow graft is preferred. Now, what is yellow graft? Who can answer this? What is yellow graft? Uh, from another person. Very good. The graft which is taken uh, from other species. You take from another person. Very good. Yes, allograft means another person. You know, autograft means same, same person. Xenograft is from another species, another species like animal. So these are the questions which are very commonly asked uh, for the MBBS student. So internal fixation, with or without osteotomy, can be done. Remember, if there is a fracture, we go for internal fixation because there is a lacking of the bone there and it is not going to heal properly. So internal fixation is necessary. And osteotomy is to correct the deformity. Remember the term osteotomy. It is usually done to correct the bony deformity. Bisphosphonates okay, can be used just to promote the ossification. Etidronet, okay, clodronet, and all padronet, these are the different examples. Pamidronet, different examples of bisphosphonate. They are the drug which we use for the ossification encouragement. And they are beneficial in this type of condition. Now, let's move further. Let's talk about some other important types of benign or benign tumor like condition or bone cyst. These are fluid or blood-filled cavities inside the bone. 
pathological fractures are quite common at the site of bone cyst because they also make that area very weak. And the treatment is by excision and bone grafting, a bit like fibrous dysplasia, especially if that is uh, you know, symptomatic. Let's enter into the different types. We are going to talk about two important types of bone cyst. One is called simple bone cyst and another is called aneurysmal bone cyst. So let's start with the simple one. This lesion, also known as a solitary cyst or unicameral bone cyst, this is just another name, okay. unicameral bone cyst appears during the childhood, typically in the metaphyseal area of the long bone and most commonly in the proximal humerus or femur. So long bones are affected in the metaphyseal area in case of childhood. Remember, it is not a tumor, it is a cyst, okay? I already explained so many times, it may look a little bit similar. The signs and symptoms are similar. That's why we have included this under the bone tumor class, but it is not a true tumor. It tends to heal spontaneously and it is seldom seen in adult. The condition is usually discovered after a pathological fracture or as an incidental finding on the X-ray. The patient has visited for some other reason and the X-ray is done for some other purpose and it can be accidentally found that there is a bone cyst inside the bone. Let's move on. Now, what, what we, uh, you know, see on the X-ray and what, uh, you know, how we diagnose the case. Now, X-ray show a well-demarcated radiolucent area because there is no bone there. There is a cyst. So that area is radiolucent, definitely, and the site is metaphysis. Sometimes it often extends up to the physial plate, means epiphyseal plate of cartilage, and the cortex may be thinned and the bone is expanded. Typical case of cyst inside the bone. Diagnosis is usually not very difficult, but other cyst-like lesion may need to be excluded. And these are, let's see here, non-osteogenic fibroma, which we have uh, discussed, fibrous dysplasia, and the benign cartilage tumor, which are solid than this bone cyst and merely look cystic on the X-ray. Now, always remember, cartilage tumors, they don't uh, look like a solid mass in the X-ray. You know, they, they look like there is, a, uh, there is a big gap there because cartilages are not seen on the X-ray. So we, we get, really get confused. Though they are a solid tumor, they look like a cyst on the X-ray. That's why uh, they are uh, taken as a differential diagnosis in case of X-ray. In a doubtful case, a needle can be inserted into the lesion under the X-ray control with a simple cyst. A straw-colored fluid will be withdrawn. Very seldom will there be any need for biopsy. So don't forget the basic you know, characteristic feature of a cyst. Cyst means with fluid filled cavity. So though, even though it is inside the bone, it still has got uh, some stroke color fluid. And if we can, you know, aspirate that definitely by X-ray uh, control, then the disease is easily diagnosed. However, if curatage is thought to be necessary, then the material from the cyst should be submitted for examination. Okay, curatage means curating, removing that lesion with the help of curate. If you think that is necessary for the management, then make sure if something else is there or not, just for that purpose, you know, you, you submit that uh, sample for the further examination. That's it. Now, all of you, please uh, focus here on this uh, radiological finding. See there, please. Now, where is the problem here? You can clearly see this area. Here, okay, and here. Now, in this, we cannot see properly 
and it is written as a healing one. Okay, it is a healing one. That's why the typical X-ray finding is not seen. And there is a needle here. See this needle? You can clearly see this needle. There is an injection with methyl prednisolone here, and methyl prednisolone is a type of corticosteroid. So uh, clearly, they are injecting that drug in that cyst area. And here's a fracture occurring through a cyst. It is not a complete type of fracture, maybe, because I cannot see, you know, complete fractured line on this side, but here, there is the one. The falling fragment sign is a typical, and the lesion is, you know, never wider than the epiphyseal plate. This is another important clue for the X ray finding. So these are the ones. Falling fragment sign. This one. Okay. Now, what is the treatment? The treatment of bone cyst, the simple bone cyst. If the lesion is a small and asymptomatic, especially in the upper extremity, you just do observation and follow up. Just observation and follow up. If there are larger lesion, if they are symptomatic, and if they are in lower extremity, then they need treatment. Now, why? Why is this difference? Why in the lower extremities lesions have to be treated, whereas upper extremities lesions we can observe and follow up? Why is this? Anybody? Because of high chance of deformity. Good. One good point you have mentioned. Excellent. One more I want. One more. Remember, the lower limbs are responsible for weight bearing. They are responsible for weight bearing. And uh, during that time, you know, pathological fracture as well as deformity can occur very easily. Absolutely. I agree with him. That's why lower limb lesions are taken seriously, even it's a case of bone cyst. So various options are curators with or without bone grafting or internal fixation if the fracture is already occurring and aspiration and injection of corticosteroid or okay, bone products may be done. So injection of steroid can be tried. Uh, just now you see that in the picture, methylprednisolone was injected there. Now this will be the last, you know, part of this big topic. This is a big class, you know, we are still talking about the benign tumor of the bone. We have not yet entered into the malignant one. So let me do this, okay? And then we'll, we'll continue in our next discussion. Now, aneurysmal bone cyst, what is this? The aneurysmal bone cyst may be encountered at any age and in almost any bone, though more often it is seen in young adults and in the long bone. Okay, especially in the metaphyseal area. So let me highlight the important points. Long bone metaphysis, almost any bone can be affected and more often seen in young adults, though any of the age can also be involved. Usually it arises spontaneously, but it may appear after degeneration or hemorrhage in some other lesion. I mean, some other bony lesion is already there. So it may, you know, exacerbate there and develop this aneurysmal bone cyst. With expanding lesion, patients may complain of pain. Occasionally, a large cyst may cause a visible or palpable swelling of the bone. Now, just analyze the meaning. Aneurysmal means, you know, it is expanding there. It is much, uh, you know, bigger than the simple bone cyst we are talking. So definitely it will give a visible or palpable swelling of the bone. Now, what about the pathological finding here? When the cyst is open, it is found to contain clotted blood and during curettage, there may be considerable bleeding from the fleshy lining membrane. So there is a clotted blood as the content of the cyst. Still, you know, it's a type of liquid there. So the general meaning of the cyst is still fulfilled here. Histologically, if we take a biopsy, the lining consists of fibrous tissue with vascular space, deposits of hemosiderin, 
and multinucleated giant cell. Now, let me ask a few questions here. What is hemosiderin? What is hemosiderin? Anybody? Sir, iron can breakdown of hemoglobin in macrophages. Iron hemosiderin. Good. Yes, I already got the answers. You know, a few of the students have told me this is the iron pigment, hemosiderin, iron pigment, and especially when this, you know, iron containing, you know, substance is degraded by the macrophages of the phagocytic cells, then hemosiderin may be formed. So simply remember this as an iron pigment, hemosiderin. Multinucleated giant cell are the big cells which are the combination of more than one cell. What about the X-ray? What we see there, okay? And how we diagnose. Let's talk about it. X-ray show a well-defined radiolucent cyst. This is a radiolucent, often trabeculated and eccentrically placed because it's a big one, you know, bigger cyst. So the clinical features are typical. Trabeculated means multiple septa are there. It is growing a bit outwards, eccentrically placed. And it is a radiolucent because it doesn't have bony content inside. Double density fluid level, septation, and low signal on T1 weighted images and high signal on T2 weighted images in case of MRI are suggestive of aneurysmal bone cyst. So these are some of the important radiological finding. Double density fluid level, because there is a you know uh, some membrane which is uh, there on the surface or the side, and at the center there is a clotted blood. So that is called double density lot of septa, and these are a typical finding of MRI. Low signal and T1-weighted image and high signal and T2-weighted. This is aneurysmal bone cyst. In a growing tubular bone, it is always situated in the metaphysis, and therefore it may resemble a simple cyst or one of the other cyst-like lesion. So metaphysis is the common side. That's why we are getting confused. Occasionally, it may uh, also occur in the vertebra or other flat bones because it may occur in any bone, but more common are the long bone. In an adult, aneurysmal bone cyst may be mistaken for a giant cell tumor, but unlike the latter, it usually doesn't extend right up to the articular margin. This is a very important difference in diagnosis. I'm going to take a class about giant cell tumor in my next discussion, okay? important tumor, especially in the epiphyseal area. Epiphysis means end of the bone. So giant cell tumor may extend right up to the articular margin inside the joint. But aneurysmal bone cyst, because it is occurring when in the uh, metaphysis, sorry, so it doesn't have that type of property. Occasionally, it causes marked ballooning of the bone end. Now see this? Uh, Let's make the concept quite clear and end today's class. See this. This is the bone cyst. This is a bone cyst. This is a, a simple bone cyst they are showing. Simple bone cyst. This B is a chondromyxoid fibroma. It also looks cystic. But uh, with the X-ray, you know, it is very difficult for me to diagnose whether it is chondromyxoid fibroma or something else because it also looks cystic just like this. So probably a biopsy is very much necessary. This is the aneurysmal bone cyst. Look at the expansile type of mass. Every student know the meaning of aneurysm. It almost looks like aneurysm here. Look at here. So very uh, easy to pick or very easy to diagnose from the X-ray. And this is the uh, giant cell tumor, giant cell tumor. Sometimes it is confused a bit similar, though it is much more bigger and it is only involved in one part. But another important point is, it may you know, reach right there, you know, uh, till the joint site or joint area, whereas this doesn't. So these are some of the important points regarding aneurysmal bone cyst. So let me stop here today.